So the show is just about at its birthday, which was January 14th, 2017, in which I released a mission statement. At the time, I was going to make just a show about music, and that was it. It was just going to be this one niche, but uh, me being the person that I am, I quickly sought a change and felt constrained by the particular format which I had developed, which was interviewing local and independent musicians, some of them very close friends of mine, and uh, we had a lot of very great conversations, but I kept them very politically sanitized, and it even got to the point where when politics came up in the interviews, and even though it was fine, and you know we were both civil, civil and everything, I would delete it because I wanted to just sanitize it and not make it controversial at all so that I could appeal to people of any demographic because more people like music than uh, the political ideas that I hold, which is hardcore libertarianism. Yeah, so we went from, I had about 20-some, I think 24, I want to say, interviews with musicians. And man, I met some really awesome people doing that. I love people that make music. I love creative people of all kinds. But the thing is, that entire world is sort of dominated by this progressive culture, especially with younger people. Just the more that I differ on the way that I see the world now. But, you know, to a certain point, I, I kind of get what they're saying, but... I just see the root of a lot of those problems in a lot different way than a lot of these people do. I mean, for example, and this really blows people's mind when I tell them how labor unions created the minimum wage to keep blacks and Latinos out of the workforce. It was created to protect jobs of white people so that it it basically, think about it analogous to this. It's someone trying to take the ladder up with them once they get a little bit higher. That's essentially what that kind of legislation does. So after blacks were excluded from the, you know, legal free labor, as it were, they created dependencies among these people and shortages artificially. So of course, what's going to happen is they're going to turn to crime and other means to uh, get capital. So they engage in black market activity. So that's why there is historically such higher crime rates among a lot of minority groups in America. But anyway, I mean, I see this as the consequences of people using this social apparatus of violence that I call the state. I just noticed that people use that to their advantage, and that's really the root of people's most expedient means to totally decimate another group of people. And I know that no matter what kind of world develops in the future, there will always be problems with these different social apparatuses. I mean, there are problems with the market too, but oftentimes it at least can learn from itself with new technology and new methods of solving problems at the lowest cost. So I just trust it a little bit more And even though profit is demonized, it really does create this sort of order that people don't even really realize. I mean, think about shortages and disasters. When the price of drinking water goes up, what does that do? Well, it creates an economic incentive for people in areas with a surplus of that good. Let's say drinking water is only 75 cents a gallon, even in its no most expensive form bottled in gallons or something in the store so even at that you know you go and you sell that for an an exorbitant profit and i mean i think you deserve that you're going into a place that's destabilized and you know problems with you know the resources there and maybe going to be without electricity shortages of gas there i mean it takes more money once you get down into a crisis zone for gasoline and, but of course, the thing that creates the ability for those things to even be there is allowing people to charge high prices because if they're not allowed to and they're, they know they might be arrested for trying to sell these things at a profit, then they just won't go there and those goods won't be there. And people will just 
get the stuff for cheap beforehand and it might get used for things that you don't that aren't as important what i was getting at <laughs> was that a, a lot of people are very progressive in the entertainment world so i sometimes don't get along with a lot of folks and i mean some of my best friends and my family are progressives so it's not like i just have a hatred of them or anything like that it's just that um i'm highly underrepresented as far as my ideological predilection in culture in some ways we're kind of laughed at and gary johnson was the libertarian party nominee he was terrible <laughs> he's a terrible candidate to have ourselves taken seriously we have to just go and engage in the culture and entertainment world I've been saying that a lot because as I shifted in this show during the course of this past year here, it's sort of been a journey for me, a journey of self-discovery and what drives me and what inspires me. If you've been listening for any length of time, you'll know that I first got into libertarianism through the anti-war facet of this school of thought. So that being said, I've started paying a lot closer attention to what's going on abroad and what exactly the U.S. is doing. I've come to learn a lot of things in this past year, some things related to the history of the Middle East, and I've been trying to pay as close attention as I can to all of the events going on throughout Syria, Yemen, Sudan, Libya, there are just so many issues that came up this past year that nobody was really talking about. They were talking about the political theater that is Donald Trump. That's what's been important to people. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. One crucial source of information for me on this topic has been Scott Horton. Over the past few years, I've been listening to his show and have learned a tremendous amount about some of the war propaganda that comes out and exactly what it is on balance with the truth. His book, Fool's Errand, came out this year and... I learned so much about that particular quagmire, and it's just, um, it, it really runs deep. And you have to read the book to get the full picture of the inner workings of who's fighting on whose side and why, how India and Pakistan work into the entire thing very, very succinctly. <laughs> Afghanistan never really was a, so much of a safe haven. I mean, it's true that bin Laden and his people hid out there with the Taliban before, but the 9-11 attack was not waged from Afghanistan. The 9-11 attack was planned in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, 
and in Madrid, Spain, and in Hollywood, Florida, and San Diego, California, uh, in Laurel, Maryland. And they had to hijack our planes to crash them in anything. They have no force whatsoever to attack us with. And the whole thing, the, the, so the, from the beginning, the safe haven myth was just that. It's just a myth that somehow Afghanistan is automatically access and and an easy way, you know, from there, it's an easy way to attack the United States when, in fact, Afghanistan is exile. It's the furthest away you could ever get from anywhere. To drive from the center of Texas to El Paso is halfway to Los Angeles. From the center of Texas to El Paso is halfway to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, that's how big Texas is. That's how big Afghanistan is. It's got mountains like Colorado and deserts like California, and it's got an armed to the teeth warrior population that absolutely refuses to give in and refuses to negotiate. That's the end of that. War's already lost. You know, they never admit we're trying to take an army that's made up from about 10% of the population and we're trying to foist it on an ethnic group that's 40%. And that just isn't going to work. That's it. It's as simple as that. It can't. And if they ever admitted that, then the game would be up. And instead, they just say, well, it's the good guys versus the bad guys, the people versus the terrorists, and we're on the side of the people. And even compare it to Iraq War II. In Iraq War II, it took eight years. But America was eventually able to successfully help the Shiite Arab supermajority kick all the Sunnis out of Baghdad and create their new Iraqi Shia stand allied with Iran. So at least there was sort of an end point there and it ended up leading to the rise of Islamic State in the predominantly Sunni areas. But in terms of creating a government in Baghdad that could last, they did. But they were fighting for the super majority population of the country, 60 something percent. We are fighting to foist a 10 percent minority onto a 40 percent plurality. OK, so shrug. That's it. Hands up in the upturned shrug motion, and then I win the argument, right? While we're on the subject of the Middle East, we should talk about Yemen. Yemen is experiencing a civil war with Saudi Arabia fighting against the northern Houthis, who took the capital of Sana'a in 2014, I believe. In the past year... We've continued the naval blockade, which restricts food and water from coming into the country. What this has done is created a cholera epidemic where people are drinking stagnant water and getting a uh, waterborne illness. I think there's also cases of diphtheria and uh, other things like that. But other than just the fighting and the war, sh the war that's happening there right now, the U.S. and Saudi are committing major aggressions against the many people who are some of the oldest people on the earth. The U.S. has supported Saudi Arabia militarily since World War II, selling arms, providing military aid, and training the Saudi military on how to use U.S. manufactured planes, tanks, and other weapons. In recent years, Saudi Arabia has bought more weapons from the U.S. than any other country in the world. Just since March of 2015, the U.S. has authorized $22 billion worth of weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. The most recent deal includes 20 Abrams tanks listed as battle damage replacements. The battle, of course, is Yemen. The weapons the U.S. sells also include cluster bombs, banned by most of the international community, and F-15 fighter planes which is making up the vast bulk of what the Saudi Air Force is currently using as it bombs Yemen. But America's aid to Saudi Arabia goes way beyond weapon sales, and it's directly contributing to the current fight. That's because Washington is literally helping to refuel Saudi planes while they strike targets across Yemen. When the Saudis asked the U.S. to refuel one of their planes, giant American tankers like the KC-135 Stratotanker take off from the Incirlik Air Base in Turkey or from U.S. carriers in the Arabian Sea. They then link up with Saudi F-15s in international airspace. These airborne refuels give the Saudi planes a much longer range and allow Saudi's air campaign to become more lethal because the planes can stay in the air longer and hit targets much more frequently. 
As of late November, the U.S. had flown more than 1,600 refueling missions to over 6,300 aircraft in the skies bombing Yemen. That's an average of two a day. In this entire era of the new terror war since 9-11, Saudi Arabia has been a key component in a lot of these geopolitical affairs. And when you peel back the curtain, you'll see them behind a lot of the machinations of the decisions that the U.S. empire makes abroad, especially in the Middle East. A major event that happened this year was the coup, essentially, staged in Saudi Arabia in favor of Mohammed bin Salman, whose only ally really in the Saudi leadership and in the monarchy is his father, who we all know, if, um, if you know a lot about the politics there, his father is dying. So essentially, the, the, the coup is against Mohammed bin Nayef, who is kind of considered to be uh, allied with a lot of separate economic interests that aren't necessarily consistent with Mohammed bin Salman. So there's a little bit of a question as to how that works into what's happening in foreign policy. The reason I bring all this up is that Yemen is Muhammad bin Salman's sort of war to gin up support. If you understand this element of history that leaders are given a lot of respect by their populace and the power elite by going to war, it's a huge part of why Abraham Lincoln is considered one of the best presidents in U.S. history. And the more that you dig things up, the more you learn that each leader in history is more well-known if he was leading some sort of global war or some sort of expansionist war or something. Now, I'd like to stay on the topic of Saudi Arabia because another thing that I learned this year was the heavy lobbying influence and just how dirty it is. I'm going to defer once again to the great Scott Horton when he had Brian McGlinchey on his show to talk about this sort of covert action to protect Saudi Arabian interests from being culpable for the crimes committed on 9-11. Here are some select clips from that episode that glean exactly what happened and how dirty this game really is. His title is Veterans Say Organizers Concealed Saudi Sponsorship of Their Trip to D.C. to Lobby for Changes to 9-11 lawsuit legislation. Well, that's kind of complicated. Uh, what's JASTA? JASTA is the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, and it is a uh, law that passed just this last September over the President Obama's veto. It is his only override uh, by Congress of his entire two terms. And this was a law years in the making. And what it does is it modifies this Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, and that is the body of law that determines when and where U.S. citizens can sue foreign governments. And what it did was modify that in such a way that cleared the path and cleared some uh, hurdles that were in place, uh, cleared the path for 9-11 families, 9-11 survivors to proceed with their mega lawsuit against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for its alleged ties to the 9-11 attacks. And, yeah, and to I mean, kind of give you a little- hell of a story here. Uh, set it up a little bit. Tell us about these three guys, the, the Cord brothers, correct? And Kassler? Yeah, yeah, Tim Cord, Dan Cord, and David Kassler are the, the three veterans I talked to. And you, to give you a little bit of background on this, okay, so JASTA passed in September. All along in the, in the run-up to that passage, you had the Saudi lobby going very hard uh, uh, on Capitol Hill to prevent it from passing. Okay, n- then it passes. Well, now they switch into uh, overdrive. You know, they, they didn't think game over. Instead, they went into overdrive in a big way in saying, OK, now we're going to uh, work Congress to amend it, to change it, to you know, take the teeth right back out of it and put some of these hurdles back in and, 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 and obstruct those 9-11 families in their uh, desire to bring the case to court. And so they you know, over this last year, you know, in the run up to the passage and after it, they have been on a influence buying spree like you would not believe. Uh, you know, people at the beginning of last year were marveling that they had, I don't know, seven or eight lobbying firms. 
Uh, McClatchy yesterday, this uh, last week, reported it's now up to 17 lobbying firms. It's keep at, you know, every time we check every few months, there's more and more of them. Um, now, perhaps chief among them is Corvus, and Corvus is the big you know, PR and lobbying firm that uh, represents Saudi interests and and helps them get their messaging out, not just in the United States, but really all around the world. Uh, soon after the uh, the passage, they Corvus went on again an influence acquisition spree, where they were adding you know all kinds of people because uh, you know, they hired their own firms and their own link uh, influential individuals to help make their case for things. Part of the Corvus plan was this Saudi this uh, veterans lobbying campaign, and what they've been doing is over the past. Uh, several months flying like 30, 40, 50 veterans at a time to Washington, D.C., where they put them up at the Trump International. So this is not a low-budget operation. Uh, that's a $400 probably a night room with a group deal. Um, uh, flying them to D.C. and getting them to lobby against JASTA. Now, the rationale that they're using, the, you know, you'd say, why would a veteran want to have any involvement in this? In, uh, in this law, particularly. Well, uh, central to the case that's being made against Jess on Capitol Hill uh, by the lobbyists, by Senators John McCain, Lindsey Graham, and, and so forth, and many other people, is a claim that, hey, if foreign governments adopt the same law, if they reciprocate and create their own JASTA, what you'll have is foreign citizens suing individual military service members, Private Smith and Sergeant Snuffy, <laughs> will be uh, sued in foreign courts. Now, we've got another report at 28pages.org that listeners should check out, uh, titled Veterans Being Misled on Justice as International Law Expert. You know, I talked to a former counselor on international law at the State Department. He's a professor of law now at University of California, Davis, William Dodge. He says it's, it's baseless because, again, as I said at the beginning when I described this law, it modifies the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. It only deals with suing foreign governments, not foreign individuals. So JASTA doesn't enable uh, you, Scott Horton, or, or these 9-11 claims to, to sue Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia. It's about suing the government of Saudi Arabia. And so uh, they're lured to this cause with a lie. Uh, some are lured with just the opportunity to take a free trip to Washington, D.C., stay at the Trump Hotel and meet senators and representatives. Uh, these, these veterans, though, the, the ones who are being recruited into it at the lowest level, you know, they come with good intentions. But most importantly of all, what they don't know is that Saudi Arabia is paying for their bed, paying for their flight, and is behind this entire operation. Mm. Whoa, hold up. Did you guys just catch that? Basically, this was the foreign manipulation scandal of the year, and nobody talked about it. The big collusion scandal of the year was that perhaps the Kremlin bought, there's allegations from anonymous sources that the Kremlin bought like a couple hundred thousand bots and put them out on social media. Which, yeah, it's some dirty business, but man, did you just hear that? Essentially, what Saudi Arabia was doing was convincing U.S. veterans that this JASTA Act would allow foreign governments to sue individuals, which is not how JASTA was worded. It's between international forces in this global sphere. And I just wanted to highlight that fact and also the fact that Saudi Arabia is America's ally in the Middle East. Anyway, I'll let these guys get back to it. Check this out. They say the, uh, the main guy organizing this trip is this guy named Jason Johns. Um, he steps up to the, to the podium or, or what have you and says, uh, hey, thanks for being here. We're really passionate in our community about JASTA. And uh, first and foremost, this is not funded. Uh, none of this is being taken care of by Saudi Arabia. And these brothers uh, and other veterans, they look at each other because nobody even, had even asked that question. <laughs> so... Right. And Tim Cord had one of the great lines in uh, in the in the piece when I was interviewing him. He said, "He said uh, you know, none of us even asked or even suspected it. It's like you broke a vase, and you're like, 
go in the living room and don't look at the vase. Right. <laughs> he said they all looked at each other, you know, wondering, wait a minute, is this funded by the, the kingdom? And, uh, you know, they go and they do their lobbying the next day. And uh, it was that next night, uh, Tim Cord runs into one of the one of two brothers who were also uh, really involved in organizing and running these trips on site. He runs into one of these guys, and uh, uh, according to him, uh, this is like at ten or eleven o'clock at night. Um, I, I'll just read this quote. He says, "This dude who's running the show, he comes wheeling out of a room with a guy he calls a lobbyist. I don't know what job that is, but apparently it's really important. He just comes rolling out of his office. They're just jacked out of their minds, totally blitzed off their nuts. So you've got <laughs> these two guys wickedly intoxicated. The lobbyist steps aside, and it's now it's just him and the uh, this uh, gentleman named Daniel Tinsley who's helping to run things. And he says." Hey man, I've got such amazing news. We've got a way to kill this bill. And our guy, our veteran Tim Cord uh, in the piece was stunned because when they're on Capitol Hill, their message is twofold as they were going door to door. It's it's that we support the American the uh, 9/11 victims families. We love those guys. We want them to have their day in court. However, we need to fix this law so that it protects our veterans. From being and and service members from being sued in foreign courts, mm -hmm. which again, as we talked about, is a is a false charge anyway. Right. So they're, they're all the time they're talking about how much they're in it for the 9/11 family. So all of a sudden you've got one of the principal organizers saying, "Hey, we can kill this thing entirely," and his idea, uh, their idea, I guess, which he had just gotten from that other smashed lobbyist guy, was that if they insert something into into JASTA, you know, by amendment, that caps the compensation that lawyers can get at five percent or ten percent or some number then uh, no lawyer is going to want to take the case. And so they basically, you know, by totally disincentivizing law firms from, from participating it, kind of kick the whole chair out from under it and render everything else moot. And then, <laughs> and then so he's got a basically intoxicated interrogation subject, and he, uh, he says, uh, he asks him, by the way, dude, who's paying for all this? And he says, you know, dude, it's the freaking kingdom. And yeah, for, for Tim Cord, this veteran, uh, that was not what he wanted to hear. Um, yeah, these guys, uh, especially the Cord brothers, uh, I, think, I think David uh, was in already before 9-11. But for these other two, they enlisted because of 9-11. And to then find out that they are being used by the government that's been very credibly linked in multiple ways to the 9-11 hijackers, uh, you can imagine the, the rage that he went into. And if you'll remember from General Wesley Clark's list that I played just a few minutes ago of seven countries that was on a memorandum that the U.S. was going to overthrow, uh, Libya was on that list. And here's what happened in Libya this year. <laughs> This is not where these migrants want to be, heading back to the African continent, thanks to aid from the Italian government to reinforce Libya's Coast Guard. It's helped cut the number of migrants arriving in Italy to under 22,000 in the last three months. It's the lowest total for four years. But people trafficking networks in Libya continue to flourish because of government chaos as rival groups battle for power. These Ivorians, repatriated to the Ivory Coast from Libya, say they risk being sold into slavery. They sell Africans over there. In Libya, they sell men. Even 15-year-old Libyans are there in a car, they're armed. They'll come and kidnap you, and they'll sell you for $70 to $150. And then others will resell you. As soon as you arrive in Libya, the first thing that happens is that you are taken away and sold. Our black brothers from West Africa, wherever you are from, a Malian, a Senegalese, or any other nationality from the West, even an Ivorian, you are sold. And for what? $700. But these migrants will tell you that life is so hard in their home country that it's worth almost any risk to make a new start in Europe. And then there's Iraq, which of course we all know is famously on that list that General Wesley Clark was citing. Even though ISIS was pushed out of Mosul in July, it's still worthy of talking about what happened the duration of the rest of 2017. 
In 2003, the US invaded Iraq because of its alleged connections to terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. At the time, Saddam Hussein, a brutal dictator, ruled the country. He was part of the Sunni minority and suppressed the Shia majority. Iraq was conquered fairly quickly, but the US had no plan for the country. The until then suppressed Shia majority took over and began oppressing the Sunnis because suppressing other faiths has proven to be such a good idea. Unsurprisingly, a Sunni rebel uprising began and terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda trickled into Iraq and local forces, often former Sunni military, began fighting the US troops and the newly formed Iraqi state, peaking in a bloody civil war in 2006. Since then, people in Iraq have basically been segregated by religion. So, in a tragic irony of history, the US invasion led to the formation of the very terrorists the US wanted to eliminate in the first place, because Iraq was now the perfect training ground for terrorism. Heading into a ruined city on a mission to eliminate the last remnants of a twisted ideology that used to rule these streets. These are Iraqi special forces. A camera filming for ITV News accompanied them on the final days of the battle for Mosul. Other soldiers are told they cannot follow. But this small unit is heading behind the last of the IS positions to finish off an enemy that was beaten but still inflicting casualties. Our guide would be Sergeant Major Salman Karim, a 27-year-old veteran of special operations against the fanatics. We will be heading this way toward the ISIS position. They are just 50 meters away, but we will get there, God willing. The plan is to slip through the broken alleyways and outflank the enemy in its last stronghold, close to the Tigris River, the first contact. Sergeant Major Karim shows us an IS radio post that has just been abandoned, along with this suicide belt. But the mission's target, an active gun position, still lies ahead, and the unit command.